Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight is October 27th, and we are very happy that you have joined us for another bond planning task force meeting. I am going to share my screen with you. We have a very full agenda for our group for tonight. So we are going to jump right in and get started. I do want to point out that um, on this first page of the presentation, again, uh, wanting to bring awareness for this group and for our community that we do have an updated web page specific to our bond planning efforts uh, and all of the work of the task force. These meetings that we are having as a bond planning task force, along with all of the presentations that have occurred and will occur in the future, are placed on this website that you see right here on this page. And so please help us in pointing our community's attention to these resources that can be found here so they can follow along as this work continues over the next few months. Again, want to start this meeting by saying thank you to each of you. We have uh, about 35 people who are already in attendance. I'm sure we'll have a few more that will be jumping in with us and we appreciate your investment in our school district and in our efforts to continuously improve. So thank you for being here tonight and for the difference you're making. I wanna take just a moment to go over today's agenda. Our topics for this evening will include a brief recap of our meeting from last Tuesday, October 20th. I will share with the Bond Planning Task Force some findings and directions that were outcomes of the strategic planning process that occurred last school year, specifically those findings and directions that interrelate with bond planning efforts and facility efforts. We've got special guests tonight in Dr. Shepard, our superintendent, and Melissa Carell, our director of innovation, and they will be sharing with you some information on innovation pathways that the district has either started or is going to be starting on embarking on. Uh, we will also embed within that portion a, a thought exchange activity to get some information and perspective from our task force tonight. And then I will be sharing with the group some facility assessment priority items uh, from the district's perspective uh, to receive uh, and get some perspective and feedback from the group tonight on some of those priority items. And we will have small group discussion around that part of the presentation as well. So for our meeting, what we call meeting two recap last week, October 20th, uh, we did have a presentation from the district's financial advisors, Hilltop Securities, as a part of the, the big takeaways from that part of the meeting last week. Uh, in that financial presentation, it was shared with us that the municipal markets are in a near historically low interest rate environment currently. Of course, we know that there's uh, uncertainty in where that goes in the future as always, but as we sit right now, we are in an extremely low interest rate environment. We also uh, learned that the current debt structure for VISD does provide ability to issue debt without a corresponding INS fund tax rate increase. And we were given three different uh, potential amortization schedules, uh, all at the same INS tax rate that we currently have. We learned at those various amortization schedules at a 20 year, uh, we have an INS tax capacity for potentially $72 million at a 25 year amortization schedule. It's just shy of $89 million at our current INS rate. And at a 29 year amortization, it's $99,515,000 uh, is the capacity that exists in that current tax rate on the INS side. We also had presentations from members of Huckabee Architects uh, where we talked through the short, mid, and long range planning process. Heard information around construction costs and what 
school districts need to be mindful of when we enter into construction. And we also had some conversation around renovation versus new construction considerations. Uh, we got some information on what the recent going rate is for building campuses of various types uh, per square foot, along with uh, some recent costs for renovation projects at school districts. Again, one more time, sharing the link there for everybody. Please push people toward our bond task force link. I want to take a moment because I believe it's really important as we were preparing for tonight's meeting. One of our conversations led us to some of the work that was done throughout the course of last school year uh, in terms of strategic planning. And it was an aha moment for me that this was an area that we had not exposed some of our bond planning task force members to. We have maybe a few of you who may have even participated in the strategic planning process last year, so you may be intimately familiar with this. Uh, but for many of you, you may not be aware of that work. And so I want to make sure that you uh, have the opportunity to see the intersection between a portion of that work and the work and the charge of the bond planning task force. So as a broad overview, a strategic planning committee met last year over the course of about two months, spent six full days together over the course of those two months, pouring through really what was tons of data that had been gathered from our community over the course of the last, really since the time Dr. Shepard arrived as superintendent. And that information came from the community at large, it came from students, it came from parents, and it came from staff members. Uh, as members of the strategic planning committee, there were over 80 members making up comprising all of those different stakeholder groups that I just mentioned, from students to board members to parents to community members to staff members and teachers. So of those 80, they were, we were culling through all of the information that had come forward over the past two years from over 2,000 individuals. So two, over 2,000 members of our community had provided us with information that was used to ultimately determine these findings and directions that came forward from the strategic planning process. You may note that there's a light blue link here. Another web page that we have is dedicated specifically to that strategic planning information. What I will be sharing with you over the next few slides is only a small portion of the totality of what came forward in terms of findings and directions from that strategic planning process. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing more, you can find it at this link right here. Now the slides that I'll be showing you next are a snippet of that work. And I wanna share the, the layout. On the left-hand side, you'll see inspire teaching and empower learning. And that's what we are referring to as a finding focus. So, so one of our finding focuses is around the concept of inspired teaching and empowered learning. And then at the top in the center is a finding, and below that, under the therefore we will, those are directions. Those are guides for things that we are working toward as a school district and a school district community to bring forward those findings or to realize those findings. And so in this particular one, and on each of these slides, I will highlight in yellow things that have, that intersect with what we should be thoughtful of as a bond planning task force as we are making decisions and prioritizing. So one finding is a culture of voice, choice, and advocacy will inspire teaching and empower learning. And therefore we will, some of the directions these are really charges for the school district to pursue as a part of the strategic planning. We will provide flexible learning environments that give choice on path, place, and pace. We will expose elementary students to various ways to discover their genius. We will provide multiple experiences for middle school students to demonstrate their genius. 
and we will provide high school students opportunities to pursue their genius. Under another finding focus that is titled Finding the And, I'm not going to go into detail on that concept of the and because I know that's something that Dr. Shepard and or Melissa is going to cover in the next part of our presentation. But underneath that area, there's a finding of all VIS students will, VISD students will find their and, they will leave us prepared for their successful launch into career, military, college, and life in order to be a contributing member of society. That's a finding, and then directions for us. Therefore, we will, through multiple opportunities of exposure, experience, and pursuit, all students will explore pathways for learning through project-based, traditional, and technology-rich learning experiences, and will engage in additional opportunities for advanced learning. And we will, through flexible and fluid career-focused pathways, provide students with the opportunity to pursue training and career-focused courses. Again, I want to ask that as we're reading through these, you think about how these may connect to facility planning. One additional one under that same finding focus of finding the and is therefore we will innovate at the middle school level by providing choices for students to engage in traditional, technology rich, project based learning, or STEM learning environments. A third finding focus that was a part of the findings and directions from strategic planning was centered around the concept of equity. The finding here was we believe there are no lesser paths, but there are different paths to a successful launch. And the directions included, therefore, we will ensure equity by removing barriers that are preventing students from a successful launch and we will identify and remove barriers to access for staff and students. And so as we proceed throughout the next few months and, and we look at our campuses and work together to prioritize needs, part of our focus will be and is guided to be around the concept of equity. And certainly a very fitting category uh, for this task force to focus on that came forward from the strategic planning process was that we had a finding focus specific to facilities. And one of the findings there was that we believe facilities play an integral role to inspire teaching and empower learning. Therefore, we will, as a direction to us as a district, modernize facilities to include flexible learning environments meeting the diverse learning styles of our students. And therefore, we will design learning spaces enabling the seamless integration of technology. Another finding underneath or direction underneath the concept of facilities was that we will establish safety standards that apply to all district facilities. Additional findings under facilities include that we will ensure staff have the resources to efficiently maintain district facilities, and we will commit to a system of long range planning. And certainly one of our charges as a bond planning task force is to submit recommendations about short, mid and long range facility needs. So those, many of these, I hope you see how they correlate with the work that we are going to be doing together that, that, that is the information I wanted to make sure you had a way, uh, that you had available to you as a bond planning task force and point it, direct it back to the work of this broad-based community group of over 80 plus people uh, and that work occurring just last school year. And with that, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to turn the presentation over to Dr. Shepard and Melissa Carell to share work with you on our innovation pathways. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Greg, it says that the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Could you undisable that? We're about to find out. 
<laughs> How about if I you make know. you the host? Um, well, I guess you didn't give me a chance to respond. Apparently, I'm the host. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I will I will kick it off with a presentation, and I've got just a, a few short slides for everyone. You should be seeing my uh, slide deck now. Is Greg, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Perfect. Uh, all right, I'm going to go into presenter mode. It'll take a second. Uh, so we've got a view to the future is what we're calling this as we think about well, I'm having all kinds of computer problems here. I'm uh, I'm frozen. I'm hung up. Can you still hear me? I can hear you. But you can't see anything. I, I, I can, can see, see you. Screen. I can hear you. I can see your slideshow. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna try this one more time because I have it set up as an actual as an actual slideshow. So I will try it again. As here we go, slideshow. Thanks, Vic. Good to see you, sir. Uh, <laughs> learning pathways. Some of you have heard this uh, particular story before, but I don't think everybody has. So let me uh, let me just talk a little bit about this. If for most of us, I would venture to say all of us um, participating in this in this particular group, we experienced school that was mostly designed around sending kids to college. I mean, if you think about students and their first day of kindergarten. Uh, we had things like centralized cafeterias. We had things like centralized libraries. We had desks uh, that were in straight rows with teachers at the front of the room often. And we thought about our subjects as subjects themselves. And, and, uh, and, and that's okay because that's how college is meant to be. Uh, but the reality is that doesn't work for all kids. Uh, about 50% of the kids at any given point in time don't go to college and it doesn't work for them. And when we've designed just one pathway for students, then we're setting up about 50% of our kids for not knowing what to do when they graduate high school. So instead of thinking about just one pathway, what we're, what we're talking about and what you heard in the findings and directions is multiple pathways. And I just use this picture as one example from literally thousands of examples that we could pull out. This just happened to be a day that I was uh, at Allo Elementary School and happened upon these kids who were building a, a crane. They were trying to build a crane at that particular time. And I thought, this is great. What a wonderful teaching opportunity and learning opportunity. And I jumped right in and started working with these kids. And this is what it is to be doing project-based learning. You could see in here, you could teach everything from math to science to uh, English if you wanted to. You could teach just about any subject through the use of this project. And so project-based learning is one of these pathways that we want to focus on. The other pathway that we want to talk about, and in large part because it, it's very germane to our community and uh, UHV and, and some of our industry work that we want to do is around STEM. So we've got these three pathways that, that we want to talk a little bit more about. But here's what I'd like for the bond uh, task force to focus on. Look at that space and that room and imagine we wanted to do a lot of teaching in that way. And then let's think about the typical classroom, which hasn't changed much since this picture, where we have desks in rows and students sitting in those desks. And it's not very conducive to either STEM or project-based learning opportunities for students. And so that then takes us into what should we be doing to make sure that our facilities can support the learning that we're going to be asking our students to do. One of the other key things that I need to talk about a little bit is finding their and. Greg mentioned that just a little bit ago. What does it mean to find your and? So we think about pathways through high school and high school is all about finding your and. And again, so many high schools, and it's not that there was anything wrong with this, it's just we did, we did the best we could when we were first designing education over a hundred years ago. Uh, it's, it, it takes a sort of cookie cutter approach to graduation in that our goal is to get the students, if you see on the left side of the picture there, all of those diplomas ready to be handed out. This is a picture from graduation stage back when we used to have graduations <laughs> before COVID. Uh, but this is graduation stage and uh, getting ready for the students to walk across the stage. And as I was sitting there that evening, I thought to myself, I wonder what these kids are going to be doing on Monday. And, and the real question behind that is, how many of those students will be getting their high school diploma and something else? How many of those kids have a high school diploma and a college acceptance letter? How many of those kids have a high school diploma and a military recruitment letter? How many of those kids have a high school diploma and industry certifications that will allow them to go to work on, uh, on Monday? And, and I think it's, it's, it's not an audacious goal at all to say we should be striking for 
we should be thinking about every one of those kids who comes to that graduation. They've found their and, and they've got, they're ready for a successful launch. And so again, it's about thinking differently about these pathways through schools because not every kid is going to go to college. We know that every kid should be able to go to college, but that doesn't mean that every child should have to go to college. We want to make sure that every, every child gets a successful launch. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to kind of talk us through these various pathways. But th there's a big point I, I kind of want to lay some groundwork for this before she starts in. And, and that is this, virtually everything you're going to see over the course of the next couple of minutes and that Melissa is going to talk about is something that we've gone out actively as a school district and sought out grants to support all of these curricular programming. So the, the number I like to brag about is what you're about to see is almost $8 million in resource grant funding that we're using to try to build these curricular pathways for our students. So with that, Melissa, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. So I, I wanted to just reiterate that, you know, as we look through um, thinking about these learning pathways, that this, these learning pathways is really a community driven um, process. Uh, last year, when we started the strategic planning process, we started with a thought exchange question. That thought exchange question was about define what a quality school looks like. What is it that you would like to see in our schools? And we had over 2000 respondents. And from that 2000 responses um, through our strategic planning committee, we actually called through, and some of you were a part of this, we actually called through every single response. And part of those response, through those responses, we developed these findings and directions. And one of those findings and directions that is so very important that you see embedded in multiple places in that strategic plan is this notion of finding your passion, pursuing your genius. It's this notion of um, having this opportunity to think about what it is as a person, how I learn best, how I am the best, not just for staff, not just for teach, uh, students, but also for our staff as well. So from that, then this community, the strategic planning community came up with some ideas about these pathways in terms of a technology rich or blended learning pathway, a STEM pathway and a traditional pathway. So we took that information this summer and when the grants came out, about opportunities that existed for us to secure some funds in order to kind of build out these ideas that the community has said, this is important. These are the pieces that we really want. We think this is important for our kids to have and we think this is important for us to do as a school district. We looked at those grant opportunities and we thought to ourselves, how can we align these grant opportunities, not just because there's money available, but because that money actually aligns to the strategic planning and the strategic path and the place, the way that we want the school district to go. And not what as an administration we decided, but basically what the community said, listen, this is what we want. We want this as the definition of quality. From that, we, we went, we sought after these grant opportunities and we were able to secure grants to begin the process of these instructional models of building out a STEM pathway and this technology rich blended learning pathway to go along with our traditional pathway. We already do a great job at our traditional pathway. We already educate a great many kids in a way that, that, that makes sense to them, that their learning modality is congruent with that learning pathway, that traditional learning pathway. But what we've noticed is that sometimes we have some kids that we are missing the boat on, that their learning style that the way that they are as a person, the things, the passions that they want to pursue are not necessarily congruent with that traditional learning pathway. So I want to take a minute to just talk a little bit about when we talk about a STEM pathway, what that means, and then we talk about what a blended learning pathway, what that means. So a STEM pathway is really your problem-based learning. That's where the problem is posed, it's hands-on, it's inquiry-based, very student-centered, and it's focusing on some STEM fluency skills that um, have been identified. And these STEM fluency skills are really these notions about collaboration, communication, critical thinking, creativity and innovation, adaptability and resilience, promptness, time resource, and management. So when I saw those STEM fluency skills, I thought those really are just our employability skills. Those are our 21st century skills that we want kids to have. So when we think about the STEM pathway, it's about taking these skills and embedding it in math, science, social studies, English, your electives, all of those pieces. 
On top of that, it is about looking at technology, thinking about our computer science pieces, thinking about engineering, thinking about those technology pieces that really are going to drive our future, right? These innovative part, uh, processes and, and technology that we can't even fathom right now and in five years from now are going to be our reality. So that's that STEM pathway. And when we built each one of these pathways, we built it for having an elementary component, a middle school component, and then a high school, school within a school, P-TECH. P-TECH stands for Pathways and Technology Early College High School. And what that is, it's a, it's a way in which we have organized that curriculum so students get the technology piece, the, te the technical piece, they get the academics with dual credit aligned to that, they have real work-based learning experiences with industry and they earn a certification. And I'm gonna give an example. So an example that we are implementing this year is our healthcare P-TECH at Victoria East High School. And in that P-TECH, we have developed a course of study in conjunction with Victoria College and our industry partners, DTAR and Citizen, in which students can earn all of the prerequisites to be admitted into the associate degree nursing program. So that's about 22 hours of dual credit that essentially after they graduate from high school, if they didn't have that opportunity, they would have to spend about a year and a half in school before they would be admitted to that associate's degree nursing, which is how they can earn an RE, a registered nurse. So what we're allowing for students to do is to earn those dual credits. We have extensive wraparound supports available for them because we know that when when 14 year olds and 15 year olds are in dual credit, they may not have the organizational skills to uh, really be successful. They may not have some of those resources to be successful. So we have all of that embedded in the program. One more caveat is I want to, additionally, I just want to share that our targeted population for this program, for these programs, are students who would not normally be in programs, or students who are at risk of dropping out of school. So essentially what we're doing is we're providing this opportunity for these students who may never have ever been in a pre-AP class or a dual credit class or never experience and, and go onto that college level class. And what we're doing is providing a safe environment for them. We're also then providing for them that social capital, that social networks that many of our other students um, already have. They have networks. Their parents have been in school. They, they want to know about a particular job. They know somebody in that job. Their parents call them. They find out about it. Many of our students that we serve in PTEC don't necessarily have those social networks already built in. So a big part of that program is to provide that for them. So when we think about these learning pathways then, we've got an elementary, a middle school, we've got this school within a school PTEC, and we're building them out for both the STEM pathway and we're building them out for a blended learning pathway. So remember that STEM pathway was really that project-based learning, that hands-on inquiry-based. What a blended learning is, is an instructional model. It's technology rich. It is also student-centered. Um, it provides personalized learning. Um, and what it does is it features both digital and traditional teaching. So um, it incorporates tried and true teaching like that lecture model, but also with a technology rich classroom technology such as um, digital, some digital curriculum, some digital pieces. So again, we have this group of students who that's their modality. That's the way they think. Additionally, when we build out these pathways, we're not only just thinking about students because what we recognize in VISD is that we're a community. And that part of that community is that we, we have students, but we also have staff members. And so we want to make sure that when these build all these pathways, that these are staff members who teach the best in the STEM model or teach the best in the blended learning model or teach the best in that traditional learning, that we provide a path and a place and a choice for them as well for them to pursue their genius. So what we have is a congruence between staff members who are in this educational setting that speaks to them. It's like, I've got this, this is the way I roll, along with students who actually who feel that same way. And so what we know is that once we have that congruence that what we're going to provide is more and more opportunities for kids to be in best fit schools taught by best fit teachers. So let me share a little bit about what that pathway looks like. So Dr. Shepard, if you would click the button. So this is not really kind of part of our pathway, but I just want to share because this is kind of cool. So one of the one of the things that we've been working on in the next in the last couple of years is developing a partnership with uh, Children's Learning Institute. 
which is a part of the UT Health Science System um, in Houston. And what the Children's Learning Institute is, is a research institute who has developed most of the, a lot of the curriculum that we currently use and a lot of the tech testing mechanisms that we currently use. And we have been fortunate enough to develop this innovative partnership to, to have, to work with them to develop an early learning childhood center at FW Gross. It will serve EC3, that's three-year-old kids through first grade. In this innovative way, we have this expertise for these um, experts in this area in which they will come and help teach our students, but also we built into that partnership that that's gonna be a learning lab opportunity for us so that we know that we can build that out um, to all of our other schools. So we're excited about that. So those students who may go there could feed into some of our learning pathways. So if you'll notice on, and I'm not good with right and left, so I might get it wrong, but if you'll notice on the right, the Smith STEM Academy, um, so Smith is one of our schools that will have that STEM model. It'll be pre-K through five. And we actually now have a person, the, the Smith principal along with the Stroman principal are participating in a design opportunity in which they are designing a planning year and designing that STEM Academy that will implement next school year. So on the left hand side, we have two schools who are participating in our blended learning, Shields Elementary and Hopkins Elementary. And, and remember all of this is so far, is all of this is grant funded. So all of these things that you're gonna see on here today are things that we have gone out and secured outside resources to begin to build up these um, pathways. So if you'll go, Dr. Shepard, to the next. So from there, kids could go to, um, to either Patty Wilder Blended Learning or go to the Stroman STEM Academy, which will provide our middle school piece. And again, along with the Smith and Stroman principals participating in a design opportunity in which they have this planning year, we're really building out the design of that school. This, the Hopkins and the Shields and the Patty Wilder principals are also participating in that design process so that we're actually planning that design of what that school looks like next year. So that when we implement, we're ready to implement, we're hit the ground running, we're at ready to implement with this quality program that is aligned to this learning pathway and to this instructional model. And Dr. Shepard, one more time. So, and this is where you can see those school within a school models. So if you'll notice on the STEM pathway, we've got that healthcare PTAC, PTAC at Victoria East High School I was telling you about. We're implementing that this school year. We participated in a planning year last year and we're implementing it this year. We have in development a STEM, and, I, and this is where it's called a T-STEM, but I don't want you to worry about the name because really it's very much like a P-TECH, just what I described before, a STEM at Victoria East High School in which we're in development with, and we're in talks with um, UHV and Victoria College to kind of work through that part. That probably will be a planning year next year for implementation the following year. And then if you look at Victoria West High School, we have an edu education and training PTEC at Victoria West High School that we will implement next year. We're in a planning year this year, along with the computer science PTEC at Victoria West High School that we will, in a planning year this year, that we will implement next year. I think I'm done with my portion. You did a great part. You did an excellent part. And and so here's where we're going to transition to get some feedback from you all. So you've heard this, you've heard this story. And before we ask you a question that we want you to, to respond to, um, you know, the other thing that Melissa didn't mention, but that we're really hopeful about is um, that we've written grants for the federal government as well to the tune of about $14 million that are stackable grants on top of uh, all these grants that you see. Now these that you're looking at on the page are, are already secured for us. So we're building it out. And the way that I described it to Melissa earlier this week, we were talking about our presentation is, you know, it's, it's as though we've assembled these resources because we wanna build this, you know, rocket ship. We wanna build this jet uh, for our kids to make sure that they have a successful launch. And we haven't pieced it together yet. Obviously this year is a, a planning year with all of these grants to make sure that the system is designed to go, but we've got all these parts and pieces. We've got all the resources to put this rocket ship together. And we think we've got all the parts and pieces that we need to have a pretty successful start. So the question for all of you, and I think the question for our community, the question frankly that we're asking ourselves is would anybody ever try to launch a jet from a dirt road? 
you know, would we ever try to launch a space shuttle without a without a you know a, 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 an attachment to hold it and a base from which to launch it from and and all the other stuff, the infrastructure that makes it possible. And the last place that we want to be as a school district with the findings and directions and 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 our charge with these pathways is to assemble the jet and and not be able to have the thing take off. And so as you think about Stroman STEM Academy, as you think about Patty Welder, hopefully you heard something tonight that really clicked with you. And like, you wanna know more about this, but you wanna know like, what should our buildings look like in order to have this type of success? So if these pathways could represent our desired future, what type of environments would you need to make, these, make sure these pathways are successful? So give me just a moment while I stop this share and I'm gonna start a different share, hopefully, if it works. Uh, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. There we go. And I'm going to go into present mode. If you are watching from your computer, please take out your cell phone uh, and and do the QR code thing. That's probably the easiest way to do this. If you're not uh, following along from your cell phone, I'm going to ask Ashley to uh, drop into the chat. Uh, the the actual link itself. So if you click, if you're on your cell phone and you want to just get into the thought exchange that way, you can. I'm going to go ahead and press play. So you have four minutes, and for the next four minutes, I will be quiet. Greg, could you give me back host status? I sent it back to you and now I need it back to share my screen again.
And that's our time. Thank you all for those of you who participated. If you're watching, you see that there was some some real involvement and it's interesting. It's always interesting to me, these these four or five people. And because we do everything anonymously in this space, we never know who these people are. But I'm always I'm always in, in, intrigued by who are those four or five people that have the voice of this particular uh, group of people for, for all 40 of us that are on the line and sharing those thoughts. So we have a couple of top thoughts. Um, and Greg, I'll, I'll let you kind of talk us through this if you don't mind being the MC. Oh, you're on mute, Greg. That's twice. The top thought I'm seeing uh, right now is an environment with multiple learning environments that's technology rich. Yeah, I think that's that's fairly self-evident. That's that's something that um, is important for for us. Absolutely, technology and the nice. And I guess what I would say about that, I was thinking, do I want to get into the deep answer here? The nice part about it is, you know, this is one of the things that COVID did for us that was actually a really good thing. It put some super super jet fuel uh, in in our process because obviously we went out and purchased thousands of devices and thousands of hotspots. So I wouldn't say that we've met our technology threshold, but we've certainly made tremendous progress, certainly far faster than we ever thought we would. And we're continuing to see the, the machine running here as these thoughts and the stars are changing. The top thought right now, an environment with multiple learning environments, technology rich, yep. also superior teachers and facilities. Facilities must be modernized. And I think that's a really important one for me. It's certainly one that I, I hope that this group talks about um, when we when we talk about Patty Welder and, and Stroman, certainly, but really all of our campuses. Uh, community and family support. Without each, the hill will be harder to reach to go. Um, safe, well-maintained campuses. Another below that focusing on a safe environment. If a student doesn't feel safe, they won't be successful. Um, and now I'm frozen up again. Uh, <laughs> so here's what I'm thinking we'll do before I, before this, this totally uh, stops on me. Let me stop share first. There we go. And what we will do is we will make this report available to you all, obviously, like everything else that we've done, we'll create a report. But if you did this on your computer, if you did this on your phone, wherever you did this, it's still open. So you can look at the Discover thoughts on here. You can see kind of what the group um, thought was highest priority, stuff we should be looking at and, and things that we should be thinking at. Um, and this is super informative to us too. When we're planning for these meetings, it was, it was one of the things that we talked about um, trying to draw some draw some information from from you all so that we can continue to meet the needs of our community. With that, um, Greg, I will turn it back over to you and make you the host. Maybe. Like I can't even find you on the list. Uh, there you are. If you go to my picture and you click the top right corner, <laughs> you're the host. All right. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Dr. Shepard and Melissa. We really appreciate uh, you coming in and, and sharing with us some of the connections of the strategic planning work and how some of that is already starting to come to, come to fruition uh, through these various pathways and these new opportunities that are gonna be available to our students. And it can help inform our conversation um, as we consider the various facility needs and how these pathways may impact that conversation. Now, the next portion of our meeting 
is intended for us to share with this group, uh, with the task force, some of the district identified priority items from the facility assessment that took place last year. And I wanna ask you to be thoughtful as we're going through this. Uh, at the end of this, we are going to have some time for small group and large group discussion about what I'm going to be sharing with you here. And so there may be things that really resonate with you in terms of what we may be calling uh, high priority items that we want your feedback on or, or moderate priority items. You may feel one that's high is actually moderate. You may feel like it's not a priority at all. We may have something listed as a moderate priority item and you may feel like, hey, that's really a high priority item. Uh, so that's some of the conversation. This is a starting point for discussion around some of the information that came forward from the facilities assessment. And to just provide us with some context as we head into that discussion and talk about campuses where we see high and moderate priority needs as an internal leadership team, um, I thought it might be helpful to have some context around the facilities that were assessed and the ages of those facilities. That is something that we haven't shared with you in terms of one page or one document where that's easily accessible. Uh, certainly this information is available on the individualized facility assessments, those very extensive documents. Uh, we'll have this information specific to each campus or facility. But I thought it might give us a good picture. Uh, many of us may be quite uh, familiar with a campus or a few campuses in the district. Uh, we may work in the district. Uh, we may have kids that followed a certain path from elementary to middle to high. Uh, or we may be a community member who's volunteered or, or been to a campus. It's actually probably pretty rare that you're familiar with all of these campuses that were assessed or all these facilities. And so I wanna just uh, give you a moment to take a look here. Uh, I'm gonna start, and I'm not gonna read through every one of these facilities, but on the far left, uh, Mission Valley would qualify as the oldest facility in the district. It was built initially in 1937. And where you see multiple years, that's where there were additions at these facilities. So at Mission Valley, there was some addition that happened in 1987 and in 1990. And so then when you see the age of the facility, that's specific to when those additions took place. So the portion that was built in 1937 is 83 currently. And then the portion built in 1987 is 33 years old and the portion built in 1990 is 30 years old. And so following that same scope, you can see that we have some uh, portions of buildings that are 80, 70, 60, 50 years old and beyond. Uh, this list does not list the campuses that were built as a part of the 2007 bond. Uh, those campuses came online in 2009 and 2010, I believe. Um, so those newer campuses, East West, Cade, Torres Elementary, and Shalimar Elementary are not listed here. They were not facilities that were assessed as a part of the assessment. So I just wanted you to have an opportunity to be able to get some scope on the age of the various buildings. You will hear me reference the fact that there were some additions that happened through uh, some of the priority items that we'll talk about and how those additions may have impacted other portions of the campus uh, for our consideration for potential needs. And so again, this will be available for those of you who are interested in referencing back. I'm not gonna hang here any longer at this point. So when we talk about high priority items, 
we are talking about district identified high priority items. These are items that, that we see as important for consideration by the bond planning task force uh, that we will want your feedback on today and moving forward. And so again, if you'll jot down thoughts that you have or you can put them in the chat uh, and we'll end up having small group and large group discussion around these. So if we were categorizing high priority items from the facilities assessment, uh, they would fall into, and these are not rank ordered. We're not saying that HVAC is a higher priority than roofing or that roofing is a higher priority than electrical. These are six categories that we consider high priority, not in any specific order. So we have HVAC, roofing, plumbing, electrical, gas lines and accessibility, what we would consider critical infrastructure. And when we look specifically at HVAC systems, the majority of our HVAC units are currently at or past useful life, which is defined here as 15 years or older. Most of those HVAC units utilize what is now an obsolete refrigerant that is no longer even allowed to be made. It's no longer produced in the US. That's called R22. It's no longer produced. It is still for sale. So we are still able to operate those machines. Uh, the supply of that, um, because it's no longer being made, quite obviously is dwindling and understanding economics, the cost of that refrigerant has become progressively more exp expensive as that is no longer produced. And ultimately it will become an obsolete unit uh, because we will not be able to utilize the refrigerant that was intended for that unit. In addition, as you know, when things age, uh, replacement parts uh, become difficult to locate. So as we have breakdowns and need to make repairs of those units, it becomes increasingly difficult to locate parts. And in each of these sections, you will see a note about priority actions that we are asking this task force to consider. One of those priority actions is to replace obsolete or past useful life HVAC units. Associated with that is for the task force to consider prioritizing adding units and ductwork to serve Shields Elementary hallways. So at Shields Elementary, when one of those additions was done years ago, uh, there were enclosed hallways. They are part of the building now, but they are not uh, air conditioned or heated. And so we have issues with temperature control in that particular building because at the time they were constructed, uh, there, was no, there were no units or ductwork put in for Shields Elementary in those hallways. Another priority action that we're asking the group to consider is to replace obsolete controls and standardize energy management systems. We have currently two energy management systems that we are maintaining. Uh, one that is very functional and current uh, was put in as a part of that most recent bond about uh, a little over a decade ago. Uh, and then we have an older system that, that is really um, needing to be upgraded. Uh, there are no longer uh, parts. It's no longer being uh, a system that is maintained. Uh, and so we're operating two systems, one of which is, is, is on its last life for energy management. Here are three pictures of uh, various HVAC units and portions of the systems. Um, there are within our detailed assessments going to be a multitude of pictures specific to HVAC systems. Um, we are just sharing with you a few pictures that are representative of some of what we consider to be priority need areas here. And then in this list, we are categorizing campuses where on the left, these are campuses where all of the HVAC units at that campus exceed the useful life. Those include 
Chandler, Gross, Mission Valley, Roland, Shields, Stroman, and our CTI campus slash administration building. And then on the right hand side, we're identifying campuses where some of the HVAC units exceed useful life and consider it a priority to replace those units that are beyond their useful life. And I'm not gonna read all of those campuses there from Allo down to Liberty, but that's 11 campuses in total that are in that category where some of the units are beyond useful life. The second category identified internally as a high priority for this task force to, to consider is roofing. The majority of our roofs for these particular facilities are at or beyond the roof life expectancy of what is defined as 20 years. On these roofs, the roof membranes are oftentimes weathered and brittle, cracked and leaking. Sheet metal flashing and gutters are rusted through in many places. And the MEP piping insulation curbs are in many cases deteriorated. And so the priority actions that we are asking this task force to consider are replacement of roofs that are currently at or beyond life expectancy. And here's a sampling of some pictures of three of those campus roofs in their current state. And by current, I should mean at the time that the assessment was, was done last school year. And then here is a listing of some campuses on the left-hand side where we are identifying a campus-wide roof replacement versus on the right hand side, a partial roof replacement. So I'll just pause here for a minute for you to be able to look at the list there. In total, we have 11 campuses on the campus wide roof replacement list. And on the right hand side, based on the age and condition of the roofs, a partial roof replacement on seven facilities. The third area or category where we're asking the task force to consider prioritization as potentially high priority is in the area of plumbing. For our plumbing, the majority of our fixtures at the facilities assessed are not compliant with current code in terms of either accessibility or flow rates. The distribution systems have deteriorated. Many plumbing lines we recognize are in walls and can potentially require extensive demo work to repair or replace. Oftentimes with plumbing, uh, you're not sure what you're gonna find until you get in there. But with the age of many of our buildings and the fact that in many of those, the the plumbing has never been replaced. You can imagine what that might be. The sewer lines have deteriorated and are failing. Many of these lines are underground and require extensive work to repair or replace. And so priority actions that we're asking the task force to consider for all of the assessed facilities include fixture replacement for code compliance, upgrade or replacement of corroded and leaking water distribution piping and upgrade or replacement of corroded and leaking sewer piping and here here are two uh, sample pictures of some of those uh, concerns in terms of our plumbing systems again many many more pictures uh, available throughout the detailed facility assessments that are available on the bond planning website specific to every facility that was assessed. The fourth category is electrical. All the campuses that we're discussing 
were built prior to current technology needs. The service capacity is severely undersized for those new age technology requirements. We experience heavy use of power strips currently and it's taxing electrical capacity and can potentially be unsafe. Electrical panels district wide across these facilities are at full capacity with no space to add breakers for additional service. Many panels and components are obsolete or non-compliant with current code requirements. And service entrance equipment has deteriorated, compromising service and reliability. In the category of electrical, priority actions that we are asking this task force to consider for the assessed facilities include replacing obsolete electrical equipment and panels, providing current code required access and clearances, increasing service entry capacity to support additional sub panels, and repair and replace as necessary service entry for compliance and reliability. And here are three representative pictures of various electrical panels across the district. And here's just a sample of what you will find in many spaces. And I would call this one actually a light sample of the use of power strips in order to meet the various electrical needs with the devices that are utilized uh, routinely in education today. A fifth category that internally we are asking the task force to consider as a potential high priority item are gas lines. We currently have gas lines that are rusting and leaking. Priority actions that we're asking the task force to consider for all assessed facilities are the repair or replacement of all compromised gas lines that are exposed on roof decks. The sixth high priority item is in regard to accessibility. This is a picture of Hal Middle School. If you've been to Hal, um, it does not have a readily, easily accessible entrance at the front of the school. Currently, there is an accessible entrance, but it's not in a readily accessible area. This is just one example of a potential accessibility need to be addressed. At the time that this campus was built, and I know that Dan from Huckabee went into um, further detail in our last meeting, but our campuses were definitely built to comply with code at the time they were built. But as you can imagine, as you looked at the ages of our facilities, many of them were built at a time that was before codes even existed or certainly before the current codes. And so we do have a responsibility to in good faith make adjustments to provide accessibility for our campuses as we are able to do so. And so that is another area for this task force to be mindful of as we look at priority needs in terms of accessibility that are identified across campuses. So those six categories are what we internally identified as high priority areas. These following categories are identified as moderate priority items, and they're gonna be specific to uh, categories around building integrity and efficiency of building use. And again, you may see some of these and say, hey, these are high priorities, and we're gonna want that feedback from you. Or you may see some of these and say, I don't even think these are moderate priorities. We're gonna want that as well. 
So moderate priority categories, lighting, window replacements, parking and drives, building envelope, updated safety and security systems, and canopies. Under lighting, we currently, across the vast majority of the district, have fluorescent lighting fixtures, which we know are poor on efficiency and lower quality of light output, as well as having a much higher ma maintenance cost. Priority actions to consider for the assessed facilities would be replacement of antiquated and obsolete interior and exterior lighting systems with LED lighting, which is more efficient, longer lasting, and brighter. And to implement lighting controls for code compliance and energy efficiency. And here's a, just a few pictures that are representative of some of the lighting in our facilities currently. The second category that we internally identified as a moderate priority are window replacement. We have still framed windows that are rusted and warped. And due to this, these windows do not seal tightly and they allow air and water infiltration. On these older windows, sealants and glazing are failing. And so priority actions that we're asking the task force to consider include steel framed window replacement for Aloe, Gross, Hopkins, Shields, and Liberty campuses. And here are just a few representative pictures of some of what was just described in terms of the condition of these old steel windows. Another category for moderate priority is parking and drives. Many of our campuses and facilities have unpaved or deteriorated paving at parking lots, bus loops, and service drives. Therefore, priority actions for the task force to consider are repaving of severely deteriorated parking lots and drives, providing paved parking lots where they are currently unpaved, and to pave high traffic gravel service drives currently in use. And so here are just a few representative pictures of some of those parking lots and drives identified within the needs assessment. And we've broken that out further to look at campuses specific for um, recommendations for consideration of repaving or paving the parking lots on the left hand side, paving or repaving the drive throughs in the center column, and then targeted repairs for a portion of the areas at Chandler Elementary on the far right. Another category, uh, another category within the moderate priority list that we identified internally is regarding building envelope. Currently our building sealants and caulking are severely weathered and deteriorating. A priority action to consider for all assessed facilities are the replacement of sealants to extend the life of buildings by reducing water infiltration to the building envelope. The next category involves updating safety and security systems across those that broad range of ages that that you saw earlier we have uh, some antiquated fire alarm systems at our campuses public address systems intrusion detection and video surveillance systems for emergency notification those systems at this point are either obsolete uh, or non-existent in some cases 
finding replacement parts for these systems because of the age is difficult. Campuses with multiple buildings. We, we spoke earlier, or I shared with you earlier, that we have campuses where parts of the campus were built over the course of time. And in some cases, those campuses are operating uh, different systems with varying levels of compatibility. And so a priority action for this task force's consideration regarding these particular facilities is to update obsolete safety and security systems. And here are just a few representative pictures of some of those panels that are associated with those security systems. And the, the last category of uh, moderate priority is canopies. We've got some pictures here of the state uh, of some of our canopies across these facilities that were assessed. And here is a listing of campuses on the left where we're asking the task force to consider and discuss replacement of deteriorated canopies. And on the right hand side, uh, at Crane Elementary, we have some walkways that are that are exposed where there may be consideration to add canopy for um, protection from those exposed areas. An area that we pulled out separately to share with the group as an additional priority item for consideration is in regard to kitchens. The majority of kitchen equipment at the facilities we're going to share with you are at or nearing end of life expectancy. As campuses have grown, because of classroom additions throughout the years, kitchens were not expanded to accommodate the increased service needs. So when you add classrooms, you add to your building, you add additional buildings, you're adding additional student population and the corresponding kitchens have not grown in relation to the expanded service requirements. The needs assessed and prioritized, these needs, what's shared with you now was prioritized by our child nutrition department for potential kitchen and dining expansion to accommodate the served student populations. Most of these kitchens are currently at less than what is half of the recommended size for a kitchen for a campus of their size. And we recognize that to accommodate potential updating of kitchens, new food service equipment may be required and existing equipment repurposed. And here's just a, a few snapshots of some of those kitchens and the environments and the tightness of some of those spaces. And then from our child nutrition department, um, We've identified some high priority campuses to consider for expansion of the kitchens space. Hopkins, O'Connor, Shields, and Stroman. In that middle column, moderate priority, Allo, De Leon, Dudley, and Mission Valley. And then on the far right column, um, long range priority, Smith, Patty Welder, and Gross Elementary. So to summarize what we just covered from a chart, we have here on the left-hand side, anywhere that there's an X, that's considered to be a high priority item for that specific assessed facility. So we'll just take Allo at the top. There are identified needs in the area of ADA code, the roof, the HVAC system, electricity, plumbing, gas, and paving. And then I should have stopped at gas. And then under the moderate priority, 
further to the right, there's identified potential needs for paving, windows, building envelope, canopies, the kitchen, HVAC controls, lighting, and safety security updates. And so each of these campuses that were a part, or each of the facilities that were a part of the assessment are identified here um, as sort of a one-stop shop of what priority items, high, moderate, or long range, were identified as a part of our internal review of the facilities mm -hmm. assessment. And so we want to make some space and some time for small group discussion. I see that we are we're really good on time right now, which I am thankful for, so that we can have some time for you to dig into um, some small group discussion around these two questions here. One of which is, what are your thoughts and questions? on the facility assessment priority items? And two, are there additional categories you believe rise to moderate or high priority? And I'm just gonna give an example there for number two. Um, I had previously a task force member reach out to me and ask that there be a, a point in time where the bond planning task force could consider whether or not to prioritize playgrounds. And so if, for example, you believe that we should be considering as a group prioritization of playgrounds as a high or moderate priority, we would want that to come out of the small group discussion into the large group discussion. That, that's just an example that was previously shared with me. Uh, but really, wanting to get some time for you to talk in small groups around uh, your general thoughts and questions about those facility assessment priority items that were just shared with you. And it's gonna take me a moment to send you guys into your small group because my master plan was to have you broken up into small groups during the time that Dr. Shepard and Melissa were presenting. And unfortunately, uh, I gave up my hosting controls. So I have some of you set, set up, but uh, I'm going to send you to those rooms. And some of you will go a little later than others as I'm adding you in. So my apologies for any delay here.
Well, if you looked or saw the blog, I'm of the opinion that if we don't replace those high priority items, we're creating an incredible, now that we're aware of them and their dangers, we're creating an incredible liability for the safety of our students and staff. And while we may have sufficient liability insurance to cover that, there's no amount of insurance that covers the life of a student or a staff member. I also uh, believe that many of our moderate priorities have to be fixed in order to keep, I mean, even if we did all the high priority, say we replaced the HVAC and we don't replace windows with energy efficient windows, we don't replace the envelopes where we're losing air and, and energy out the cracks, then uh, we're, we're facing huge utility bills. <clears throat> I, it just seems to me that, that one. And is it really an all or nothing? And should we, you know, we have majority of our schools are older than 30 years. And then, you know, we look at a bond that's a typical bond, a long bond is 30 years. So maybe we should be talking about, you know, after a school is 30 years old, maybe we should be evaluating whether we needed to start replacement on that. Um, and, and maybe 32 years for replacement of a school is too young, but if you look at the average age of our school, way, way older than 30 years. Usually the, the the building itself is usually pretty good. It's all these other things that they mention are usually the issues. You know, you can always, that's where you get into that point of how much it costs to keep it going versus tearing it down and rebuilding. That's where you got to get some comparison in at that point. But again, I, you know, I'm writing these things down. If you're talking about 15 years for HVAC systems, I don't want a 20 year bond issue for something that's going to have to replace five years before I'm through paying it off. You're going to have to look at a 15 year bond. If you're looking at the sealant every eight to 10 years, now I'm looking at something that I need to have 10 years bonds for those kind of things. So that these things are coming out when I can reissue to take care of those same, same things on and on. And then you're actually covering the cost of those items for their lifespan. I mean, it just truly that's what you would look at if I was depreciating equipment. You're going, to, you're going to depreciate it so you have the, the, uh, the money saved up to buy a new piece of equipment at the end of its useful life. And that's exactly the same thing we have to do here with the bond issue. So that's where my concern is. And also, Tony, can know, I? I have to agree, windows are going to have to be replaced. If you've got water coming in and, and air going out, you know, you might as well go ahead and move those up because that's really probably a major issue or high priority and not really in a moderate area. And Tony, you touched on something there that I think that we would want um, as we move forward for our uh, financial advisors to, to address in more detail, which is the structuring of how debt is paid as a part of a bond. Yeah. Because it's oftentimes assumed that all the work that's done is paid out over the course of the 20 or 30 or whatever that year schedule is. And that's not necessarily the case. You can structure payments in a manner that address uh, the fact that some items that may not be as expensive as big time renovations or new buildings or things of that nature can be paid off in a shorter time period, acknowledging the fact that they have a shorter useful life. And when we're talking to the business people out there, they're gonna have to be understand that portion as well because they're going to think like I did. You're talking about depreciation of equipment. Well, they're going to say, I don't want to go with 29 years on something that's going to have to replace twice during a 29 year period. You're going to have to come up and say, okay, we're paying off this portion that covers these items or something like that. You make a great point. We definitely have to be mindful of being clear and communicating that depending on whatever plan comes forward from the group. Mm -hmm. Because I know like that plumbing and all, I can see that being 29 years, 30 years, gas lines, you know, 30 years, those kind of things there. I don't have anything, but, you know, 15 years for HVAC, you know, I agree. You know, at the, when I was at the service center, we didn't every 15 years. 
but I didn't have bonds. I had to save up money for all of that. And, uh, you know, and I only had 20 units. So for me, it was easy. It was only a couple of hundred thousand. Great discussion here, guys. I'm going to jump into another group. Thank you. Guys. I think that's why it's on the critical list because it is something easily fixed and relatively inexpensive as a whole. Have y'all had a chance to talk about items that may have not been on that prioritization list that you think should be, if there are any? Uh, we uh, discussed that uh, window replacement and building envelope should probably be, if we're replacing the roof, that should be replaced with them at the same time. That makes sense. If you're gonna I fix one, heard. you should fix the other. I've definitely heard that sentiment in a few other small groups that I've been traveling through. I, I think that's the main main items that have stuck out to us uh, so far that maybe needed to shift from the moderate priority up to a higher priority. But that, that window of, of being able to do that is, is closing rapidly. Hey, Dr. Momwald. Hi, guys. How's it going? Great. It's going, going well. Have you all gotten a chance to talk about both questions, uh, both your thoughts and questions about the information on priority items and anything you think might rise to the level that we didn't include? We talked about the things that were prioritized. I don't know that we've really addressed anything that wasn't included or you know didn't make a priority list. Yeah. Well, while you're here, can I ask you? Sorry, and I know you're just hopping around, and I don't want to keep you, but um, sure. it is just a thought of like, when are we going to get to the point of like, well, you know, we just need to level that one and start again versus like just make some repairs because um, some of those campuses had like X's across the whole line. Is that discussion coming later? Yes, um, and please bring that forward as you share out some of the conversation in your group. I heard that in other groups, so I think it'll be confirming to some of the other groups that what your part of what your thought process is 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 echoed in other places, um, and and certainly that will be a part of you know we started that conversation just very high level last week about new construction versus renovation, and are there thresholds at which you say gosh, it makes more sense to start fresh with that particular building versus put this amount of work into it given its age and then life expectancy beyond that. Okay. We don't have a specific number here, and so that's part of what we will be talking about and working through in the next several weeks together is when that makes more sense. If we know it does at some point. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to jump out into another group. Thank you. We'll see you in a few. I guess for the rest of you guys, like, is there any priorities that you didn't see on there that you think should be priorities or anything that should be bumped up that we haven't talked about yet? One question, actually. Dr. Bonewald? We were actually, we were actually uh, catching uh, everybody up on the conversation from last week, actually. And, and so we were about to dive into the, the question that was actually at hand, and I, I was about to tell them I was going to pull up my PowerPoint uh, <laughs> just to remember because we We've been having a good conversation here. Uh, before I do that, I don't know if you can pose are, are you Are you trying to say y'all were not on task, Mike? Is that what you're saying? Well, well, it, was my, it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm curious um, for, for you to consider whether there are, one, are those priority items high and moderate? Did they make sense? Are there things that, are in moderate that you think should be high or vice versa? Or are there things that we don't really care about, we don't think are big deals for us to address that we have identified? And then have we just completely missed something that we think 
needs to be considered as a priority. So such as um, the playground example. I was going to jump in and say, I mean, overall, Greg, I mean, my biggest assessment of everything y'all went over was everything you guys brought to the table were, were needs and not wants. I, I think that's probably just kind of a blanket statement. Um, I don't disagree with the priority prioritizing of which I brought uh, out. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm in line with, with kind of everything you guys assessed. And, and certainly, thank you for, for sharing that, um, Cody. And, and certainly there will be a time potentially, well, the, the, we will want to open up space for our bond planning task force members to share uh, if there are wants. Um, but we definitely want to start by identifying what we feel like as a leadership team from the assessment and our experience uh, are high priority needs. They're just kind of baseline infrastructure things that, that we struggle with currently. So I think before we got on to the, uh, the small group, I saw a comment in, in the chat about maybe the whole building envelope uh, being considered a high priority. And what, I think what they're referring to is that the windows and, um, well, walls essentially, everything about the roof uh, wound up, or electrical I think as well, kind of wound up uh, in the moderate. And I think what he was saying was that maybe they ought to be high priority set. I'll throw that out to you guys just to see your comment on, on that. And I'm gonna, we're gonna ask uh, someone to share out from the uh, group. And I know, Mike, you've been one of the leaders to talk, but I wanna ask that Mike not be that person. Go, uh, I'm not Mike. Mike. That's what I was just saying beforehand. <laughs> you know, we, we definitely appreciate him being here as, as a part of the Huckabee team that uh, performed the assessment and worked with our staff to identify uh, needs from the campus and district level. Um, but definitely want our task force members to be the ones engaged in the conversation of sharing thoughts and perspectives and leaning on Mike and others as a resource and expert. So I'll give you some time to dole that out and jump into another breakout room. Thank you. Well, I shared out last week and he doesn't like the same person sharing out. So oh, oh. Well, I vote for Cody. Did you not say that Mike? Mike is struggling right now. But uh, so um, we're at the second question. Are there additional categories you believe rise to moderate or high priority? And I think we just addressed what is high priority to us, HVAC and roofing, and then everything else falls afterwards. Right, right, absolutely. I think electrical. As I've gone from building to building and kind of looked and peeped inside of teachers' classrooms and different offices, I see these power strips that scare me. I see <laughs> power, power strips plugged into power strips in these buildings. And it, it just scares me because I know that's not really safe. But everybody's trying to make everything work. And so, I mean, they're putting a band-aid on it. So, I guess to some extent with HVAC and roofing and plumbing, I guess I see electrical in, in there too. Mm -hmm. And um, and gas lines that are rusting and leaking, uh, I find a little scary as well in our campuses. Well, what is the value of safety when you just went through that list of six for our students and teachers? You know, you know, is associated to money. Can you put a dollar price on that? Very good point. Absolutely great point. And I would say you can't put a dollar price on that, but for voters to want to pay more taxes, you know, I mean, that's the that's the hard part. It is, but it's always in the message. And, and to where the value were the taxpayer, whether it's county, city, district, whatever, if they see they get a value in the quality that comes out of it, you know, it, they become a little more receptive. Mm -hmm. those, some of those numbers. I, I think uh, uh, before we end right here, I, I think there's uh, three major things that you were talking about because we want to get a bond passed. I think that would be one, an investment into the community. Um, 
you know, really the community get a, a good sense of what they're getting out of it. And then to the money issue, the people who really don't want to see anything come out of their pockets, how can we show them that it's an investment into them as well? Correct. And then also, I think one of the biggest ones is staff. So the cafeteria they were talking about, you know, those people are making the children's food and, and controlling their nutrition. I think it's important for them to be happy. And um, I mean, uh, I think that they're just as important as the students also. And so I think those right. are three important things moving agree forward that, for sure. that would be important to get these things passed. So for that would, at least for everyone to vote on it. It's, it's <laughs> right. It's literally, no. it's literally proving to everybody who's going to be voting on this that it's not, it's, it's yes, it's for the kids, but it's also for the staff. And, and like you said, the kitchen staff, the custodial staff, the people who do maintenance on the buildings themselves, this is going to help them tremendously. I mean, it, it is literally a bond like this and everything that we're talking about is, is literally benefiting everyone. That's why we go back to the understanding of the articulation of how it's presented and how it's promoted. You promote, right. like I always tell people, you look at the, promote the cents versus the high dollar because people are a bit under pressure that they're going to spend millions when they're only going to spend 45 cent extra. You, right. you, you focus on that and you focus on safety and yeah. the betterment of, and for the, for the kids dealing with and dealing with the staff and because this coronavirus they know that we need our, our teachers because we're ready to throw our kids right back well my <laughs> wife a teacher so you know i stay with mine but anyway right um, yeah so yeah yeah i agree with that Just going to wait a moment. It takes a few minutes for everyone to be sent back into the, the large group. Greg, I'm going to tell you, I didn't leave the meeting. I just had to turn off my computer uh, because we were getting feedback when we were in the same room. <laughs> ah, <laughs> so that was an accident. I'm, I'm sorry that no, happened. That, that's okay. Not a problem. Um, well, thank you very much. I tell you what, I got to spend a little bit of time in each group and there was some great discussion happening and there were some real common themes that I was able to see uh, coming out of discussion. And so I want to make a space now for each group to have a representative to share out uh, responses to those two questions that you went to small group to discuss. To, to discuss. First of all, uh, just thoughts or questions about those priority items that were shared with you? And then two, are there areas that, that we missed that need to be included that were not a part of what was shared today? And so with that, uh, we're gonna go in reverse order and I'll ask for whoever the spokesperson from group seven was to share out to start. Do I have a spokesperson from group seven? I didn't catch my group number. Was that our group, Trey? Um, I, think, I think we were six. We're six. Are, you're group okay. six. So okay. good, group seven would have been Corey, Dr. Hunt, Pastor Greer. I nominate Corey. I nominate Dr. Hunt. <laughs> I was late to the party, and so I would not do the due diligence that was needed. 
Uh, so our, our our group talked talked about. I mean, we we did cover a bunch of different different albums, but uh, a lot of it was making sure that that we a lot a big focus of our group was kind of whenever we bring this bond kind of to the community and all this stuff, um, and we start kind of presenting it in a certain way that we need to focus on kind of how we share the way that it's going to allow everybody to realize that it's, it's the benefit of, of every single person that is in this community, whether it's just for the community as a whole, um, staff members, the kids, um, the, all the way down to the kitchen staff members, um, the maintenance crews, anybody that it has, that is living in Victoria kind of basically that this will affect in the future. We also talk about, we talked about how you have to be willing to spend now in order to save the costs and, and everything for the future. Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious that if you, you spend the money now um, over the long run, you will save a lot more later on in spending. Um, the, the safety issues we talked about um, with the gas pipes, exposed different things like that. Um, and, and just when we push that stuff, like I was talking, I had brought up a point kind of about, I saw like on um, when we were talking about the moderate, the high priority items, um, security was one of them. Um, we just got, uh, we were kind of saying security and everything like that, the, the gas just needs to fall kind of under a safety umbrella to where if we present that, I mean, because eventually our goal is to get this bond passed. If we present everything as a safety issue, not just the individual as well, that, that it would, it'd be a big push. So, I mean, if we had secure, uh, I think it was security that was falling under moderate. That was one of them. Like in my opinion, I, I would even push that over to, to high. I mean, anything dealing with safety needs to be a high priority, especially in today's times. Um, and so that, that was kind of the things that we had talked about, but you have to be willing to spend and just the ability to not just show this is how much you're going to be paying. This is how much the, t the taxes. I know that's important and everything, but it's just being able to articulate the right words like Dr. Hunt was sharing with us, um, articulate the right words and kind of share that uh, to make sure that it is. What, what were you saying, Dr. Hunt? I, I, it's now escaping me. Um, uh, say that one more time articulate how, what? yeah how, how you said how you said how we need to share or how do you need to articulate kind of what we're trying to push here for the bond well basically i was saying that we have to articulate the word for the, um, basically in the perspectives of, of of the need like when you look at uh instead of saying millions of dollars focusing on the millions we need to right. focus on the cents because most people will look at the uh looking at the big dollars as they're finna pay a whole bunch of money when it's only a 45 cent you know yeah increase so just focusing on it how we promote it and market it yeah um, there you go thank you very much corey uh yeah. and dr hunt um, <laughs> i'm going to want to make sure we have some space and time for each group so i'm going to ask that the uh, group six representative which i think may be cody all right we um we had a you know very very good conversation um we um we felt we identified a, an observation that everything that was brought to the table was was definitely on a on a needs basis and just kind of looking at what it was you know it didn't include anything that may come down the line in our conversations in the weeks to come that that everything the focus here was needs based and not wants based and that was um i think something we felt like the that the community may respond to really well um you know kind of with experience with the past bond they um they, they did identify quite a bit and the feedback was that there was some some excess so um i definitely think that, that the assessment was good we felt like the priority uh prioritization of the uh, different topics was was in line and uh, we did go into some details about some specific campuses that were at a point where you know they may have so many check marks of what they need that that there may be a need to uh opt not to renovate and to rebuild and we did talk about some of the uh some of the obstacles that may come with uh, you know opting to do that and what the community's pushback may be with uh, the nostalgia of uh of of you know whether it be you know 
demolishing a campus or what have you, whatever, whatever that result is, is that there is a connection with folks to those, to those schools uh, that, that may eventually need to be rebuilt. So um, I'd say that was, that was everything in a, in a pretty quick minute. Thank you very much, Cody. How about a uh, representative from group five? I was elected this week. Hello, Bethany Castro. Um, so we we pretty much agree with all the high priority items. Specifically, HVAC is extremely important to us. Um, we have a principal in our group um, who is at a campus that the um, you know kids didn't have AC for the first many 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 weeks of school and in a certain wing and that's unacceptable and we really want kids and teachers to be comfortable um, so that they can learn. Um, some things that also came up just like um, Mr. Cody was just saying is um, just the idea of just leveling campuses and starting from scratch versus just making these repairs. Some of those columns have X's all the way across and um, we have Mr. Dan from the architect firm in our group um, and he cautioned us to not look at dollars yet but look at you know kind of what are our priorities if we're not thinking dollar wise. Um, but at the same time you know sometimes you just have to think through those rebuild versus renovate, renovate um, situations and so that's kind of where we were um, and I just wanted to mention that in case any other groups were thinking about that as well. Um, and then we had two issues that we might want to kind of elevate their priority level. Um, the first was uh, technology infrastructure. We weren't sure if that would be included in kind of electrical, but um, we want to, you know, there's times where there's a whole classroom of children trying to be on laptops at the same time and they just don't have the Wi-Fi capacity or they don't have, you know, um, the internet wattage or whatever you call it. Um, they're just not able to do that. And um, so we want to make sure that our campuses are wired for these more modern um, ways of doing things. Um, and then another thing that we brought up was, uh, you know, our transportation system is not system, but our buses are really, really old. I've seen that screen a lot, um, you know, where we have like 32 year old buses on the road um, with hundreds of thousands of miles on them. Um, I don't know and we weren't sure if that could be included in this type of bond um, or not, but we do think that that should be a big priority for safety for our children, specifically kids that might be going to away games and having to come back late at night and having bus issues. That's just not safe. Um, so that's pretty much um, what we talked about. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bethany. How about a representative from group four? I'm up again. So our group, um, the consensus, consensus was that um, it was a good job prioritizing. However, um, all of these items are essentially high priority. Um, if we had to pick a few that were at the top, um, we would say HVAC and roofing, keep the AC in and the rain out. But uh, along with that, electricity, gas, and plumbing are super important. Um, we talked about safety and um, that it was discussed at what point, if, a, if plumbing needs to be replaced in a whole school, at what point are we reaching the 50% of touching a, a facility that it would entail having to um, acknowledge other things that need to be covered also. And then everything else everyone else said too. <laughs> That's a great point. Great question too. And I know uh, Dan is making note of that and we'll make space to come back in future meetings to talk around that question about what takes there, us to that 50% potentially. There was one additional category that's brought up in our group. That's playgrounds at the elementary. They need to be yeah. included somewhere. Yeah, that was mentioned also that playgrounds have a huge impact um, at the elementary level for students and teachers and then the neighborhood as well because families that live around there may go and play on the facilities on the weekend. And so that may be something that incentivizes parents and neighborhoods where elementary schools are closer to um, want to vote yes for a bond. Thank you very much, Group Four. When I was just yep. talking real quick on playgrounds, I didn't know if there's been any talk about um, how extremely hot it's been during the day, and how a lot of uh, school districts have moved to put covers on many of their playgrounds. I just wanted to hit on that real quick because I heard playground. Thank you, thank you for um, sharing that with us, Justin. Appreciate you adding that to our conversation. 
Uh, do we have a representative from group three? That would be me. So in our group, we discussed how we felt the building envelope and windows should be considered a high priority. Um, we were taking it as if we're not going to rebuild any schools and we're just going to rehabilitate those envelope, the building envelope and windows need to be a high priority because we need to fix the outside and make sure the elements aren't getting in before we start doing other repairs that can end up getting damaged if our buildings aren't protected, our windows aren't sealed. So if we, for instance, with doing the HVAC, if we don't have sealant on the windows or the building, we're losing that air, we're struggling keeping the heat in. So we just thought those should be moved into that high priority area. The other thing we were discussing was um, maintenance. So if we're promoting this bond, maintenance needs to be a high priority where we can get the community that we have a maintenance plan in place once we make these corrections that we're gonna find a way to keep this maintained because we don't wanna essentially kind of leave it that, okay, we're gonna fix this, but we don't really have a plan should things continue to break or deteriorate depending on um, the life if we just renovate versus building new. We also talked about promoting it as safety and environmental concerns versus just cosmetic to the campuses. Um, and that's basically what we talked about. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in, but that was mainly what we covered in our group. Thank you very much, Celeste. How about a representative from group two? Maybe, maybe everyone, our consensus was um, well, like group seven mentioned prioritizing. Uh, our group mentioned it's all important. Uh, group seven, four and three mentioned health-wise safety issues. We agree. Um, looking at, at uh, the sentence, uh, looking at different, uh, the amount of time that our bonds for, uh, we can pay back our lesser um, cost items to repair and pay them back within that time period and not finance at a longer period of time. Um, we spoke of future needs, future bonds to be set increase m and o for repairs as well and look at our best interest in keeping up code um, comparison on repair or replacements was also discussed for facilities and, and, and as we we will do our best to, to come up with those costs so that everyone would be in the loop thank you we all need sir that's three <laughs> Patrick um how about group one? That would be me, I guess. And I don't know that we're going to add much to what you said. Safety and security issues that come from the high priority items were primary discussions in our group. Um, now that we're aware of those from the analysis, it looks like if we don't do something about it, we've got some liability issues that we're going to have to deal with. We, uh, we know that an awful lot of the things that are done are behind the walls. They're not sexy. Uh, people don't see them. And uh, it's hard to talk about putting money into uh, something that you don't see. We too felt that it was uh, strongly important that we move windows and envelopes up to group one, uh, up to high priority. Uh, if, you, if you can't keep the air conditioning in, you can't afford to air condition the whole lot, great outdoors. We, uh, we also talked some about playgrounds and uh, talked about the fact that those are the sprinkles on the cupcake. Um, you, you, you don't see what's behind the walls, but you do see the playgrounds. And so that could help with the selling point. Uh, other groups mentioned the same thing. I, I think pretty much everything else that we talked about had been covered. Um, I, the, the additional move to high priority was the, the windows and the envelopes. But you just you you can't not do the HVAC, the uh, the roofing, the plumbing, the electrical, and the gas lines. And the plumbing, the electrical, and the gas lines are not uh, are not pretty items. Those are things people don't see and they don't understand why it costs so much. When you tear out a wall to get to the plumbing and you have a, absolutely no idea what you're going to find behind it. So those were basically the points we were making. I think they're all high priority when you get down to it. 
I'm going to, I'm going to take, add. Did anyone want to add anything to what was shared there from the small group discussion? I, if you don't mind, um, Dan from the architecture firm did, he said exactly what you said, Dr. Morgan, just, you know, it's not the sexy stuff that we're talking about. I really like that. Um, and, but you really don't want an entire bond project to be over and the community looks back and goes, where did you spend my hundred million dollars? Um, and so, you know, how can we maybe put, and that's where kind of our discussion of leveling things and starting from scratch versus these repairs, you know, how can you put something that is a nice new building in front of people where they get to look and say, oh, that's where my money was spent while also doing some of these more behind the scenes repairs and coupling those things so that um, people do feel like things are getting done, even though it's not sexy. Yeah. Definitely saw some recurring themes as I had the opportunity to go into each of the small groups. Uh, some of it related to the interrelated nature to some of the things on the moderate priority list and how they may have impacts on items on the high priority list. Uh, some of the groups discussing, um, as you see some campuses that have a lot of X's or check marks across needs, um, how, how do you get to a point where you determine when uh, it's too much and you have to go another direction or start fresh? So uh, definitely not giving answers there, but those are just some of the things that, that I heard discussed. If, I, if you would allow me a football analogy, uh, being where we are and being that I'm a uh, former coach and son of a coach, um, many of you may have an affinity for the Dallas Cowboys here. Uh, and while this work that you're talking about is not what we'll call, I'll use the word attractive, uh, it's, it's kind of like in football when you have a bad offensive line. Uh, it's not the part that gets all the attention, but you sure notice in a hurry if you haven't invested in that infrastructure up front. And so some of that conversation, uh, that may be something for you to be able to use as an analogy if in the future you're talking to others about the less attractive work that's really important to the functioning of a school campus. Uh, I do want to pull up my uh, the presentation for just a, a couple of parting pieces of information before we say goodbye for tonight. You know, you are working with the school so you should not be surprised that you have some homework and this is what i'm asking for you to do guys we are first of all our next meeting is november 2nd that is six days from today because we are not going to meet on a tuesday which is election night we're going to meet on that monday evening and here's what i'm asking you to do if at all possible share with at least five people what you have learned so far uh, one, about VISD's innovative pathways, about some of that work that was described tonight in the strategic plan and trying to provide new opportunities for students in the future. And then also about some of these district identified high and moderate priorities. And part of the great value of having a task force of community members is that not only can you provide us with perspective, but each of you is connected with others in the community and we ask that you leverage that to expand our reach and bring back information and thoughts. I'd love to hear, hey, I had conversations with some people that I interact with in the community and we talked about these things and here's additional feedback. So that's my challenge to you between now and next week, five people, innovative things happening and high and moderate priority. Some of those non-attractive, somebody come back and tell me you talked about the Dallas Cowboy offensive line. Last but not least, uh, again highlighted in yellow there, it's Monday for our meeting next week. It's a one and only Monday night meeting. Topics that we will potentially include uh, are to share out about your homework, what feedback you received, taking the priority items that we talked about here and bringing some cost estimates to you to address those types of priority items that have been identified that we discussed tonight. So again, we're taking that funnel, we're starting off really broad and we're continuing to narrow the funnel in terms of the specificity of the information. So we'll look at uh, cost estimates. If time allows, we'll look at those cost considerations for those various priority items and put that up against those capacity considerations from one of our early meetings or from last week's meeting where we talked about here's various potential INS 
capacities. And then again, if time allows, part of the, the charge of this group is not only to talk about the short term, but to talk about mid and long range planning for the district. And so uh, I know that's a conversation that will evolve over the course of many meetings, uh, but we may begin some of that conversation too about how to potentially prioritize short-term needs and short-term projects versus mid and long-term projects down the road. Thank you very much. Uh, I feel like we had an extremely productive meeting tonight. Really appreciate all of the focused work in the small groups and in the large group share out. Uh, I'll stay behind if anybody has any questions, uh, but just want to wish you all a, a great week and we'll see you on Monday, November 2nd. And the good news is the Cowboys are not playing that night. <laughs> That's great news. Everybody have a nice evening. I'm just saying my